Hello, everyone. Welcome to our session. Hope you've been having a great FA so far. My name is Xi'an. I'm a research scientist working on machine translation at Facebook. So today with my colleagues, Sono, Angela, Rudy, we are very excited to share our latest progress in conversational AI. Facebook is all about conversations. Through conversation, we share experience with each other. Could be a nice bike ride or lunch at a newly opened restaurant. So across our family of products, we focus on advancing the state-of-the-art AI to help people stay connected, enrich the way we communicate, and get things done. So what do we mean by conversational AI? Let me show you some examples. First, conversational AI is about being able to understand language using everyday conversation, such as together, movie, with many M's. Second, it's about being able to provide useful information relevant to the conversation, such as providing movie showtime. Conversational AI is not just for English. It is a multilingual experience. Last but not least, conversational AI is beyond chit chat. It's about being able to incorporate knowledge to be able to answer questions. So in this talk, we'll dive into each of these four capabilities of conversational AI and share some of the very exciting work we've been doing. So let's start with the machine translation, where we improve the robustness model to better handle language using conversation. At Facebook, our mission is to give people the power to build a community and bring the world closer together. One way we accomplish this, accomplish this is by breaking language barrier using machine translation. This mission particularly resonated with me because I have friends on Facebook who speak multiple languages. I'm sure you do as well. So this C translation feature helps me to connect, stay connected. For example, when my friend Christian just published a biography in Spanish, and when my friend Angela, who just moved to Paris and began to speak more French. So last year, we launched translation in Messenger, which can automatically translate messages to your preferred language. The model behind them are our neural networks, which are the state art in producing very fluent translations. However, it still got room for improvement. In this example, Sono was very excited to tell us, the movie Captain Marvel just came out. Let's go to watch it. Let's look at the Chinese translation. First, it got the word movie correct, which is great. However, the model took a wrong interpretation of the word out. And the Chinese translation was telling me Captain Marvel was out of the game, which is super sad. So why? Why conversational language is so hard? What are the challenges we're dealing with? First, language, especially informal language, is very diverse. There are more than one way to write color, to laugh out very loudly, and to be angry or angry. <laughs> Second, language, special language on Facebook, is very dynamic. There are new words, new concepts coming out every day, and they become viral. We, before we can adapt our system, and such dynamic and diverse nature of language does not exist just for English. It's common across many languages. So what can we do about it? Traditionally, the approach is to consider there's user-generated content, so they're noisy data. So what we can do, we can normalize them. For example, convert British English to US English. And um, if there are new words coming out, we'll generate a new label for them to annotate them or eventually we don't know what to do with them, we just throw them away from our training data. So here, we are taking a very different approach by acknowledging that it is a real language people are using every day in their conversation. So we need to develop more robust and scalable machine learning models. So instead of assuming there is a common standard we can normalize to, we focus on learning the underlying environment and representation. Keep annotating new data is not scalable. So we leverage weekly supervised learning to learn from the unlabeled data itself. Finally, we know neural networks are very sensitive to noise. So we proactively identify and correct such brittleness during training. So let's take a closer look at what each of this means. First, for learning in various representation, our goal is to be able to generalize to unseen words. For example, I'm given a word badassery, which I've never seen before. However, I know the word badass, and I know a lot of other words which share the same suffix. So as a human, I can make a guess. So how can we teach neural networks to do that? One approach is using character-level encoder. 
So we feed very fine granularities input to that model, such as character embeddings or byte embeddings. And then we learn convolution filters to learn to extract character engram features of different granularities. And finally, we combine those features to generate learned representation for this new world. Similarly, we can learn invariant representation for the entire sentence. So to do that, we need to design some task for the neural network to learn from. So one simple yet effective task is self-reconstruction. So what does it mean? Let me explain. So given a sentence, we first corrupt it, such as scramble it to change the word order or change some letters. And then we train a denoising autoencoder to reconstruct it. Specifically, we feed the input to an encoder network, which will generate hidden representations. And then a decoder network will take contacts from the encoder outputs, called attention mechanism, and try to reconstruct what is the original sentence. By doing so, the encoder-decoder network will focus on the high-level abstract meaning of the sentence while not being sensitive to the input variations. The good news is that such task does not require any actual label data. We can just um, throw a bunch of unlabeled data and learn it. So this is actually an um, example of a weekly supervised learning, which is a very powerful paradigm to help us dealing with the dynamic nature of a language. So let me show you another example called iterative back translation. To train a machine translation model, we need parallel sentences, which are, for example, English, French sentences, which are translations of each other. So such parallel data, they're expensive to get, so they're quantity limited. Nevertheless, we can start with them, train our first version model. Meanwhile, we remember we have huge amounts of monolingual data, unpaired data. So we can put them, we can feed them to our trained translation, machine translation model, and then generate the translations. So then we can somehow have kind of pseudo training data. So then we can use this pseudo training data to help us training. So concretely, for example, we have French monolingual sentences. I fed it to the French to English machine translation model. And then the, we have the generated English translations. We're using that together with the original real French sentences to train the English to French translation model. So although such kind of pseudo training data is not as high quality as the real parallel data, however, given the large quantity, and on the target side, we have the real, real data, the model can still improve quite a bit. So we got a version two of the model. So in return, sorry, in return, such improved model can generate even better pseudo training data, which we can put to train our next version model. So we can keep doing this, and by doing so, we created a positive feedback loop between the two models, where one model gets better, generate better pseudo training data for the other model, and the other, and the other model doing so in return. So we can do so iteratively until the gain has saturated. And notice that in the whole process, we only have a very small amount of labeled data, and we are leveraging huge amounts of unlabeled data. So far, we covered how we deal with challenges which naturally arise in data, and our work is not done yet. Recently, neural networks are found to be very, very vulnerable to adversary examples. Unfortunately, this is the case for a neural machine translation model as well. So what does it mean? Let's, uh, let's show, uh, let me show you one example where I have French sentences. I fed it to our current model, which correctly translated to if only I could build up so quickly. So then we make a minor change to the input. Here are just four letters. Let's see the translation, which the output has changed quite a bit, and the grammar is not even correct. So as you can imagine, typos like what we do every day on our phone can be accidentally, accidentally become adversarial examples. So we don't want to deploy a model and let it break when facing adversarial input. So the good news, we can leverage this property in training. So that is the idea behind adversarial training. So similar to regular training, we feed our examples to the network and do the forward pass, compute the current loss model. However, we do additional step. So we have, we learn the adversary generator whose job is try to construct adversary examples for the current model. 
Specifically, it will try to look at the current training data and figure out, oh, how should I change the current input so that this data, this example can trigger a very big loss for the current model. So this is where the model is bad at. So we put it back to training. So by learning the model's own weakness, the model will become better, more robust iteratively. So let's see how it works. So as mentioned earlier, neural machine translation model have quality drop when facing adversarial examples. And if we do nothing, the relative quality decrease is about 24%. After we apply adversarial training, such relative quality degradation, the lower the better, has shrink to 20%. And meanwhile, the model got even better generalization, which is measured on the regular test set. So overall, adversarial training gave us a 20% improve, 22% improvement on adversarial robustness, which is great. So to recap, we developed three techniques to deal with to help improve the robust, robustness of a neural machine translation models. First, we utilize character encoder to learn environment representation. Second, we leverage weekly supervised learning to join train with the denoising autoencoder and iterative back translation. Finally, we proactively identify and correct model's weakness during training using adversarial training. So today, those three techniques are running in production, enabling more and more conversations around the world. By building more robust neural machine translation models, we improve the quality of translating conversational language by 13.5%. With that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Sano. Welcome, Sano. Thanks, Yan. Hi, everyone. I'm Sonal Gupta. And today, I will talk about developing technology to enhance conversational understanding in assistant technology. So we want to assist users to complete tasks. So when they ask about where is the movie playing and when, we want to give options and results. Or if they want to make a booking in a different language, we want to understand that and also support that request. Or if they want to go back to the conversations that have taken place and ask about directions to that place again, we want to give directions to those. So to be able to develop such technology of understanding and execution, Generally, it is done using intent slot filling. By intents and slots, what I mean is that when a query comes in, we look at what is the task of the query. So what is the intent? So over here, how's the weather tomorrow in Montreal? So the task or the intent of the query is to get weather. And to complete this task, the parameters of the query are slots. So to give this answer, we want to know what's the date, which is tomorrow, and what's the location, which is Montreal. So together, now we have an intent slot filling system in which you can think of this as a function call in which intent is the function name and slots are the parameters for that function. This is usually backed by a knowledge base or API calls. Generally, these intent slot filling systems are done using sentence classification and word tagging at the same time. The state of the art techniques for that uses neural models which one of the examples is to use embeddings and bi-LSTM layers followed by CRF, in which we jointly predict what is the intent of the query and what are the slots for the words. So over here, the intent of the query is to find weather, and the slots for the words Menlo Park is location. Note that each query can only have one intent, and each word can only have one slot in this representation. And this is very limiting. I'll give you a few examples why. Let's assume you are at your home and you want to turn off the lights and play music. Now, because each query can only have one intent, you have to say them in two different queries as compared to just saying them at the same time. Or if you're really liking that song and you want to send that song to your friend John, and if you say send John the song I was just listening, because the words can only have one slot tag, the phrase, the song I was just listening, is sent as a message. But instead, what you want is to send the song to John so that John can listen to that song. So how do we enable that? We propose a model with different and more complex representation. For an example over here, for the phrase, the song I was just listening, the 
slots for this phrase for song is type as before and just as time, similar as before. And the intent for this phrase is to get media, same as before. And we want to send this media to John. For that, John has the slot of contact and the media is the message that you want to send. Note the difference over here. Now the intents can be composed inside the slots. So whatever result we get from executing intent get media can be sent as a message. And the whole query, send John the song I was just listening, has the intent of send message. This representation has several advantages. As we just saw, it is very expressive, so it can handle much more complex queries. It is easy to annotate, so we can gather large amounts of training data quickly. And because it was a tree, as we just saw, there are several tree parsing algorithms already that exist in the literature that we can use. And most importantly, the execution is pretty straightforward. Because we are still in the intent slot paradigm, we can plug the system into the existing systems and execute these type of queries. So to parse into this tree structure, we can use any tree parsing algorithm. And we see that the algorithms that are geared towards tree parsing perform better than generic parsing algorithms. One of the algorithms that we explore is RNNG parsing in which it generates a sequence of actions to generate the tree. It has three neural network components. One is tree stack LSTM, another is buffer LSTM, and a sequence of action LSTM. The tree stack LSTM learns the partial tree representation, and the buffer is storing the words that we haven't passed yet. At each stage, we take an action to compute the next step in the tree. In the data that we gathered and released, we see that RNNG performs much better than more generic sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. So the bars in green are for RNNG, and the bars in gray are for sequence-to-sequence -sequence models. Apart from giving high accuracy, a tree parsing algorithm actually always gives 100% valid trees as compared to a non-parsing algorithm like sequence-to-sequence. -sequence. Though the accuracy of sequence-to-sequence -sequence algorithms is also pretty good, which is quite surprising. Now, these approaches work really well when you have large amounts of training data. But we have around 6,000 languages on Earth. How can we possibly collect training data for all these languages? So the question is, how can we exploit data that we have in a few languages and use it to get better models in different languages? My colleague, Sian, just talked about machine translation models. And those are easier to train because they only need parallel data. Here we consider how can we use such machine translation models and all the enhancements we are doing to them to improve the intent slot filling models. And we explore three types of knowledge transfer techniques from different languages that we have training data for to other languages. The first one is to automatically translate a training data in a high resource language. By high resource, I mean resource languages in which we have large amounts of training data for, for example, English. Second is cross-lingual word vectors. And the third, our model is cross-lingual contextual word vectors. And I will explain what each of these mean. For translating the training data, it's quite straightforward. We use a machine translation approach, take the sentence in English, let's say, and translate it to the target language. The intent of the query is the same, so that's easy. And for slots, we use the word alignments from the machine translation system to get the slot annotations in a different language. The second one, which is quite popular, is to learn meanings of words, which are the word vectors of word embeddings for different languages separately. And then you can learn how to map them to the same language. Once you map them to the same, sorry, same space. Once you map them to the same space, the tags for the words, for example, king and hello, can map to the words Ray and Hola. In this work, we look at how can we learn these cross-lingual word vectors contextually. And the reason contextually is important because words have different meanings in different contexts. And we want to exploit that. So for this system, I'm going to give a very brief overview of a machine translation system. This is the general representation of a neural network machine translation system in which it starts with an encoder 
So if you're tr translating from English to Spanish, we'll have an English encoder, which will give us a sentence representation, which we can feed to a Spanish decoder, and it will give the Spanish translation for the sentence. So in this work, we combine two lines of work. First is contextual word vectors, in which we take such a machine translation system, and we just take the encoder from it. Note that over here, the representations of the words, we can use them as embeddings. And because we are learning them in context of other words, these are contextual word vectors. And we can take these contextual word vectors and feed it into any NLP task and improve that task. The other line of work are these multilingual machine translation systems. So the previous ones, it will learn a new model for every language pair. But we can have a model in which we can learn different language pairs in the same model. So over here, if we just feed in, in the encoder that we want to get a French output, then we can have English to French, or even English to Spanish in the same model. In our work, we combine these two lines of work. And we want to learn these multilingual contextual word vectors. So we take the machine translation system and make a straightforward change. We feed the flag that we want to translate into in the decoder. So over here, from English to Spanish, we feed a Spanish flag in the decoder, and the model learns that. Or we can even go from Spanish to English, and in the decoder, we can feed that we want an English output. Once we train this model, this encoder now is language agnostic. It has seen all the words in English and Spanish together and doesn't really discriminate between them. And so we have learned an encoder that can encode multiple languages together. And we can feed these representations that were learned contextually in an intent slot filling model. In our experiments, we compare two kinds of setup. One is when we take just the target training data. And another in which we take the target training data, combine it with English training data, and see the results. Our work, which is in the green bar over here, in both those settings, it gives quite good results for Spanish and for Thai. So in short, I just described our research efforts in conversational AI that can help users to complete tasks. Now we can have technology that can send your friend John a song you're listening to in multiple different languages. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite my colleague Angela to the stage. I'm Angela, and in my PhD, I focus on how we can improve machine learning models by incorporating external information. In this section, I'm going to discuss how we can improve conversational AI models by using external knowledge, both to do two tasks, first to answer questions, and the second to have domain-specific chit-chat. Let's start with question answering. The goal of these, uh, in daily conversation, we ask a lot of different questions. Some of these questions are fact-based such as, what's the weather today in Montreal? Or in this question, which planet is Captain Marvel actually from? So how do these models actually work? Given a question, such as the planet that Captain Marvel is actually from, the models need to produce the answer. In order to enable this, we give access of a content paragraph, which is going to be an informational paragraph the models can read. This is very similar to how I would answer a question that I'm not sure the answer to. If you ask me something, I would need to go read something online in order to find out the answer, and then I would be able to tell you. So concretely, how do models like this actually work? First, the text of the question is passed to a neural network module called a question encoder. In this case, we use an LSTM. Similarly, the content paragraph is given to another neural network module, in this case, the content encoder. These two neural networks are going to interact through an attention mechanism. The goal of the attention mechanism is to basically leverage the question to try and find which words in the content paragraph could provide the answer. Subsequently, the question, the attention, and the content paragraph outputs are passed to a third neural network module, which has the goal of identifying the answer span. And these are essentially which words in the content paragraph could produce the answer correctly, which in this case is Earth. So tasks like question answering seem very complicated. Models are given access to this entire content paragraph and have to read through it and understand what's going on to be able to actually answer the question. 
But I argue that actually many tasks like this are simpler than they appear. In the case of this question, for example, we don't need to understand the entire paragraph. We just need to look at the beginning to understand which planet Captain Marvel is actually from. And this is a problem. Why? Well, at first glance, it seems that we should really be able to exploit this. Like, why can't we create models that understand that there are simpler ways of shortcutting the reasoning task to answer it? But this type of shortcutting is incredibly harmful. And the reason is because at training time, models don't learn as much as they should. Instead of tackling the true task of reasoning through and understanding language, they're simply learning these basic shortcuts instead of confronting what they should be. So let's walk through a concrete example. In a training data set, there can be many questions about planets. For example, here, we show questions that are in three different domains. The first is a scientific fact, the second about Star Trek, and the third about a video game. And all of these questions are about planets, and they happen to have the same answer as the one about Captain Marvel. The answer is Earth. So the reason why this is harmful is because models can actually start learning simple associations, such as memorizing the fact that the word planet often occurs with the word Earth. So instead of actually looking at the content paragraph that might be provided with this question, they just simply see the word planet and they know Earth is a planet and they'll return the answer as Earth. This is harmful because when we change the question to something like which planet is known as the red planet, instead of saying Mars, which they might be able to do if they actually reason through the content paragraph, models may still return Earth, which is an incorrect answer. The algorithm we propose for solving this is called generative question answering. It does two tasks at the same time. The first task is a standard question answering task. Given the question and the content, how can we provide the answer? The second one is more interesting. We do a switch here, which is highlighted in green. And the switch is basically, instead of just providing the answer, models now need to take the answer and the content and write the words of the question one by one. The reason why this works is because writing the question correctly is very challenging. Given any answer in any content paragraph, there are a variety of different questions that could be asked, and they could be asked in many different ways. Further, because models have to actually write the question, they cannot learn simple associations like planet and Earth. To write the question, which planet Captain Marvel is from, models need to learn that there is some relationship between planet, Captain Marvel, and the word from. In our work, we showed that generative question answering has competitive performance in a variety of different question answering tasks. And I'm going to focus on two particularly challenging ones. The first task is called adversarial sentences. In this task, the content paragraph is modified not just to contain the true answer, but to explicitly have a confusing sentence. For example, in this case, we've inserted the sentence that at the beginning of the film, Captain Marvel thinks that she's a Kree warrior from the planet Hala. I'll show some results now. To read this graph, basically it shows answer accuracy, so the higher the better is on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, we show some representative models from the literature. Our model is highlighted in green, and we show that compared to existing models, we're able to do much better on this adversarial sentences task using this question generation training. Another task that we evaluate on that's very challenging is long input. So to train most question answering models, models are given the content paragraph, and this paragraph is guaranteed to contain the right answer. But this is a bit of an artificial setting. If you ask me a question, I don't know exactly which paragraph contains the right answer. I might have to read a whole bunch of them. So this setting tests model in this case. Similarly to the previous setting of adversarial sentences, we show that our models perform substantially better. In the previous part, we discussed how we can use knowledge to answer questions. And now I'm going to discuss how models can leverage external knowledge in order to have conversational chit chat. Current chatbots are only able to have very generic conversations. So now I'll discuss in a previous section how models can use uh, very specific forms of knowledge, such as information about the weather. But in this section, I'm going to discuss how we can use actual free text knowledge, because a lot of knowledge in the world is not in a convenient form that we can just make an API call to. So how can we make models like this? First, we need to make a data set. In our data set, we're going to have two people talking. The first person is the learner. And the learner is just going to chat normally about a specific topic, which in this case, we're going to stick with our Avengers theme. But our data set has, of course, a diverse array of different topics. The second person chatting is the expert. Unlike the learner, before the expert chats, they're going to consult a knowledge bank of information. 
They're going to identify a relevant fact that they can use. In this case, the fact that in Avengers Infinity War, the Avengers and the Guardians of the Galaxy join forces. And based on this identified knowledge fact, then they're going to chat. So every single turn of chat that they have has to be grounded specifically in the knowledge that they've identified. The conversation is going to continue. We collect multiple turns. The learner will speak again, and then the expert will respond. Every single thing the expert says first has to consult a knowledge bank, and then based upon this, give a chat, and so on and so forth. Using this data set, we can train conversational AI models that use knowledge by basically training a bot to replace the role of the expert. Instead of having the expert talk, we're going to have the bot consult the knowledge, and then based upon this knowledge, speak. And so we can create models that are able to have domain-specific chat. So how do models like this work in a detailed manner? First, we take the chat history, which is basically everything that's occurred in our conversation so far, in conjunction with an information retrieval system to identify possible knowledge sentences. So in this case, the knowledge could be information about Avengers Infinity War. Subsequently, the knowledge sentences and the chat history are passed through a neural network model that encodes them into a matrix representation. Afterwards, the knowledge sentences and the chat history are used to perform an attention mechanism. Now, the goal of this attention mechanism is to decide which knowledge sentences are going to be relevant. So you can think of this as analogous to the expert deciding that, oh, I have five different facts, but I'm just going to focus on this specific one in order to generate my next dialogue turn. Afterwards, the attention mechanism and the chat history are passed through a third neural network module, which has the goal of actually creating the dialogue response or what the model is going to say next. So given a model like this, what does it actually look like? Here I'm going to show an example of me chatting with this conversational AI bot that I created. And I'm going to start with the fact that my favorite comic book character from the X-Men is Rogue. And the model is able to respond in a relevant manner. It says that it loves Superman, but it also loves Wonder Woman. We can continue, for example, me asking if you've seen the Wonder Woman movie, and the bot will continue again relevantly, saying, I did like the movie. And we can continue chatting like this. Notice that the bot is able to have very domain-specific conversation, even in this selective domain where I talk about a comic book character from the X-Men, and it has access to information. For example, it can reference this fact about the Marvel Cinematic Universe. So in this section, I discuss two ways in which we can incorporate knowledge in conversational AI. First, by asking questions, and second, by having domain-specific chit-chat. And now I'm going to invite my colleague, Rudy. Thanks, Angela. So we've seen a lot of amazing research today. And what really interests me is how we can take these technologies and actually put them into production. To demonstrate this, let's go back to the example of understanding intent and conversation. So as we've seen, conversational AI needs to be robust to typos and spelling variation. So when Sonal types movie with multiple M's, the system still knows that she means movie. It also needs to be able to resolve word ambiguity. So when I'm asking, where is the movie playing, it knows that I'm using the word playing in a different sense than in the sentence, Cookie Monster and Elmo are playing a game. Pre-trained word vectors have been the state of the art for natural language systems in recent years. These representations provide a vector for every word in a predetermined dictionary, and these can be used as inputs for a neural network model. However, these representations cannot handle the challenges that we've just seen, as words like movie with multiple M's would most likely be out of all vocabulary. And because we have just one vector for every word, we cannot handle the different senses of words such as playing. Sonal has earlier showed how contextual word representations trained on machine translation systems can be useful for conversational AI. However, this requires parallel data to train, that is, texts and its translation, and this data is limited. The question is, can we further improve these representations by using the abundant monolingual data that is available? So recent research has shown that language modeling is a very good task for training these representations. In language modeling, we're training a model to predict the next word in a sentence based on its context. So in this example, we would like to know that the next word is playing. To be able to do well in this task, model need to be able to understand text both at the semantic and the syntactic level, and that is what makes it a great task for generating representations that actually understand text. 
Since we don't need any supervised data for training these language modeling tasks, we can use these uh, big available monolingual corpora and that improves our model's accuracy. The most successful models for this task use self-attention. In the self-attention mechanism, every word can take into account all the words in a context. And that is what it allows us to learn different representations for the word playing if it appears in one sentence or in a different sentence. The fact that we're virtually unlimited in our training data allows us to learn really big models with millions of parameters and many layers of self-attention. And this even further improves the model's accuracy. To deal with typos, slang, and generally words out of vocabulary, we can use compositional word embeddings uh, based on subword characters or bytes, such as Xian has shown earlier. We can now use this model as an encoder to generate these contextual uh, word representations and feed that as input into our neural network model. We can now further fine tune these representations on our task specific data and even further improve our results. So how useful are these representations for conversational understanding and practice? On the plus side, we've been seeing significant improvements on a variety of tasks across Facebook, and even more so when we train these representations on conversational text. However, remember all these layers of self-attention that we saw earlier? These makes the models huge and really slow, and it's actually impossible to use them in the conversational setting in production. So is all lost? Should we just throw these models and go home? No. We can still use these big models as teachers to train smaller student models. So in the knowledge distillation paradigm, the teacher model processes the training data and generate artifacts that help the student to learn more efficiently. Let's see how this works in a few more details. So for a student model, we use an LSTM network whose input is bytes. This allows us to still preserve our robustness to typos and spelling variations. We then pass our training data through the teacher model and we generate the probability prediction for each class. We feed these predictions together with the training data into our student model and train the student on the KL diversions between the teacher's predictions and the student predictions. Training on these soft prediction probability labels um, significantly improves the student learning compared to when we just train it on like hard, true, false labels because it allows it to learn nuances in the data. Additionally, we can now increase our task-specific training data because we can train our teacher model on unlabeled data and use the teacher to generate the predictions. Now, instead of a huge model that is hundreds of megabytes in size, we have a small intent student model that is actually small enough to fit into, product, into device and meets our latency requirements. Shipping the student intent understanding model to productions brings a 10% improvement in the completion of high value actions based on AI suggestions, such as calls and location sharing. So when I'm telling you this story now, it all sounds very simple and straightforward. We had this teacher model, we had a student model, and bingo, we shipped it, and we're really happy. The reality, of course, is much more complicated, and we had to do many iterations until we found the best model that we can ship. To facilitate this process, we developed PyText. PyTeX is an open source natural, modeling, natural language modeling framework that we developed with two main goals in mind. On the one hand, easy research. We want our researchers and engineers to be able to iterate on new ideas quickly and easily. On the other hand, we want to have a simple path to production. So once a model has proven its value, we want to deploy it to production with minimal engineering overhead. PyTeX is built on PyTorch, which makes it faster for prototyping and experimentation. It's Python. It has an API just like NumPy, and when you execute your program, your model runs directly, which means that you can bug, debug it using your favorite Python debugger. It also helps that now all of Facebook is on PyTorch so that we can share code and knowledge across Facebook. When we're doing research, we want to try out many different things, going from simple model architectures to more complicated ones. Earlier, Sonal has showed you our current model for uh, intense slot and tagging. But that was not actually our initial model. Initially, we had two separate models, one that was doing the intent understanding and one that was doing the slot tagging. Only later on, we tried to combine them into one model that does both tasks jointly. To facilitate these iterations, PyText is a component-based system with many models included so that you can mix, mix and match your components and rapidly iterate <coughs> on different architectures. Once we have a model that we're happy with, we want to ship it to production. Currently, we transform the PyTorch graph into a CAFE2 graph using Onyx. 
This works nicely unless you have flow control flow operations, such as for loops or if statements, because Onyx cannot convert these to CAFE2. We are now in the process of replacing Onyx with PyTorch scripts. So now instead of having two different frameworks, we will be able to go with PyTorch all the way to production. At Facebook, we believe in the value of open source technology, and as part of that, Pytex is open source, so you're all very welcome to use it and co to contribute to it. To summarize, Facebook is all about conversation. So to achieve our mission of building, giving people the power to build community and bring the world closer together, we need to build AI that understands the type of language that people actually use in conversation. As we've seen, language is complex, dynamic, and multilingual, and we, our challenge is to preserve this diversity while bringing in the AI to facilitate the conversation. We've discussed today technologies to make translation and intent understanding more robust to the vibrant nature and conversations, and ways to address the complexity of language by handling complex queries and making use of knowledge. Finally, we need to build all these technologies at scale for all languages to work on the billions of conversations happening on the Facebook family of products every day. Thank you for your attention.